acknowledge today dozens of students from all four classes who have been recognized by National Honor Societies and by Zoom College, from Phi Beta Kappa inductees to our Balfour Scholar Award recipients. Let us extend our congratulations to these students. Some are given to underclass students whose departments are recognizing the promise in a given field. Most awardees are seniors who over the past four years have distinguished themselves as scholars and academic citizens of Wheaton College. This is also a day to honor faculty members who have been important in the lives of these students, including the Senior Class Faculty Appreciation Award. Finally, we will announce the faculty member who has been chosen by their colleagues to hold an endowed chair for the next five years. And I'm moving into the first part of the program officially. It's my pleasure to introduce our Honors Convocation Speaker, Professor Francisco Fernandez de Alba, who is the Howard Mealy Professor of Hispanic I have had the pleasure of knowing Fran for years, and in fact, we were in a writing group together. This means I had the immense privilege of reading inchoate yet already brilliant parts of Professor de Alba's book, Sex, Drugs, and Fashion in 1970s Madrid, before anyone else. Lucky me. I was also the beneficiary of his thoughtful feedback on my work. And that kind of intellectual exchange is priceless. It is what we do, it is who we are. Professor De Alba embodies that passion, that dedication to education in all its forms. This is why, in addition to his many scholarly publications, ranging from transatlantic studies defining cultural movements and their appropriations, he has served in a multitude of roles at the college and beyond. As a department chair, as a member of our accreditation steering committee, as a curriculum committee chair, as a member of the CFO search, and I could go on and on, but I won't. I will let him speak because he will tell you much better than I could what education should mean and can mean to all of us. Please join me in welcoming Professor
the company of his neighbor and sidekick, the illiterate farmer Sancho Panza, he wanders far from his home in a quest for justice, battling giants, actually windmills, and against fearsome armies, flocks of marine ship. The novel opens with a famously evocative line. Whether you understand Spanish or not, just listen for a moment to the way it sounds. En un lugar de la mancha, de cuyo nombre no quiero acordarme, no ha mucho tiempo que vivía un hidalgo de los de lanza en astillero, a dar antigua, rocín flaco y galo corredor. With the permission of Professor Pedro Turibio, who is Whitman's expert on Cervantes, I want to talk about the value that a book as old as this can hold for you. But first, let me share a few words about why the book is important for me. You see, my parents come from Spanish town in La Mancha, the region that lies between Madrid and Andalusia, and which serves as the backdrop to Cervantes' tale. As far back as I can remember, I have known Don Quixote's story. In La Mancha, his image appears everywhere, in hotel walls, in restaurant menus, street signs, match books, brochures, and in the form of statuary. The first time I heard Don Quixote was when, by pure chance, I pulled the graphic novel version from my handbook shelf. I was 12, and I was mesmerized. Over the years, I read the segments of Don Quixote in school, saw the TV series, and came to know Picasso's famous rendering of Don Quixote's figure. But it was not until I was completing my master's degree at Syracuse University that I read the two-volume novel. Written in 17th century Spanish, it, it was hard work. But the story is so funny, humane, and touching that I felt deeply rewarded for my efforts. Don Quixote wondered how much of fighting his causes while I, a dyslexic Madrileño in snowbound upstate in New York, pursued with my own singular conviction an advanced education in literature. It surprised me to find out that I, too, in more ways than one, was a man of La Mancha. Let's go back for a second to my mother, who is still beside the cemetery. For more than half my life now, the two of us have lived on separate continents. When we talk on the phone these days, she likes to tell me how she's making her way through the hotel. Often we laugh, sometimes she asks me questions. To her, it's not just any novel. The moment that she reads Don Quixote's last lines, when she gets there, will mark the biggest educational achievement of her life. In many ways, reading this novel is her own mad quest. Because my mother, being one of the eleven children, was taken out of school after the third grade to help out at home. It was not until she reached her late forties with four children that she was able to return to adult school to earn her basic education diploma. But despite her lack of formal education, she has been, all her life, curious and eager to attend any education that she could. Whether in the form of books, museum exhibitions, or concerts, and for no other purpose but no more. Literature has been a way for her to learn about the world in its breathtaking diversity and complexity. Similar to my father who, after he retired from a career in sales, enrolled in a university program for seniors. At age 76, he earned a liberal arts degree not all that different than the one you will be getting in two weeks. My parents, who never had the benefit of formal education when they were young, can be an example to all of us. They are living proof that your education does not need to end when you leave the classroom. Education in its best and most realized form is a lifelong pursuit. I want to share a section of Don Quixote with you, one that my mother has not yet reached. Because I think it might hold meaning for those like you who are in the cusp of deciding on a life path. Don Quixote and Sancho arrive to the palace of the Duke, where they are about to suffer some serious joy. Just for laughs, the Duke appoints the unsophisticated Sancho as governor of the Insula de Valcaria. 
fictional place, whose name we might just leave as far as As Sancho contemplates his good fortune and the riches he imagined will soon come his way, he wanted to be marvelous at Sancho's amazing lack. Sancho, after all, has done nothing to earn the position and appears ill prepared for the role. So Quixote gives his friends some advice. Make it your business to know yourself. This is, this is the most difficult lesson of the world. Yeah. Despite his lack of schooling, Sancho becomes a just scholar. As a leader, he's guided by his wit, power of observation, careful listening, and common sense. And despite the incessant challenges that the Duke and his men would throw at Sancho to confuse him and to get a laugh, even including a fake invasion of the island, Sancho succeeds in protecting the community and being a just leader in the process. But being a good governor, I will argue, is not Sancho's biggest success. His biggest success comes instead in the realm of self knowledge. Continually reflecting on his experience as governor, he concludes that the things we wish for may lose their meaning for us once we get to them. As a poor farmer, Sancho had always dreamed of wealth and power, but now that he has supposedly attained them, he realizes that he was happier as a poor man. Following the only path that is true to himself, he resigns and goes back on the road with another. But Sancho is such a good governor that what was originally a joke meant to ridicule the notion of a government led by a commoner turns into a statement for the virtuous use of power, regardless of its order, and the opportunity everyone has, regardless of the station or education, to be fair and just. Don Quixote's advice, know thyself, is as old as civilization, Western or Eastern. 3,000 years ago, in Greece, this advice was engraved on the Oracle of Delphi. More than 2,000 years ago, in China, it was written by Sun Tzu in The Art of War. Today, you can hear it in tech talks or stumble across it in your Instagram feed. Know thyself is an exhortation to self reflection and self awareness. To be mindful and honest about your desires and ambitions, as well as your real abilities and abilities. To learn what you actually want and need, and the cost you're willing to pay to achieve it. Know thyself is not a box to check, but rather, like in education, a never ending process of becoming. So, how do we follow Don Quixote's advice today at a time when we are endlessly entertained and distracted? Literature offers a possible answer to that question. Don Quixote is about the importance of both travel and reading, or in other words, of lived experience and learning. A combination we have helped you practice here at the But now, now it's up to you to find and pursue your own mad quest. No matter where your path takes you, I encourage you to bring an old book along with you. Even one, like my mother chose, that you might never face. It will help you connect with enduring questions of the human condition. Because life gives you experience, and it will. Take the time and devote your attention to self reflection. Think about what your experience is teaching you and what is important to you. Assess where you are and where you want to go, and change what you need to. In the process of reflection, every challenge you face is an opportunity for growth. May you be as true to yourself as Sancho.
this point in the program, we are pleased to acknowledge this year's curricular award recipients. The distinction of global honors. Global honors recognize the students who complete a rigorous curriculum that requires engagement with cultures and societies outside of the United States or outside of students' home country. Global honors students integrate a global perspective into their work through advanced proficiency in a second language, deep study of the structure and culture of non-US societies, a study abroad experience or a global project and a reflection capstone essay. Will the following students please stand if they wish and are able to do so? Erica Trufa. Business and Management, 
Gabrielle Rocha Fellows. The Diana Davis Spencer Prize in Business and Management, Corey Bannon.
Haley Boos. The Edward O'Dowd Prize for Excellence in Latin, Sophie Wilhelm.
The Abby McCluskey Memorial Prize in International Relations, Erica Trufa. The Meg Kearns Prize in Psychology, Eleanor Grimm. The Lydia Dorman Prize in Religion, Charlotte Berman. The Hadath Prize in Science, Cassie Rodriguez. The Lucretia Mock Prize in Sociology, Ariana Natchez. The Lillian Hellman Prize in Theater and Dance Studies, Benjamin Campbell. <laughs> the Theater and Dance Studies Award for Excellence in Acting, Morgane Kmet. Alyssa. 
Myers. Ms. 
impact on shaping the minds of future business leaders is truly commendable. Let us express our gratitude to all faculty members, including our runner-ups, Professor Bray and Professor Chapman, and congratulate Jesse Noten for their outstanding contribution. Their commitment to excellence and dedication to uh, excellence and dedication to education shaped the lives of countless individuals that now towards a brighter future.
eulogy is deeply shamed by her scholarly approaches in software that she's right next to me, but I have to say these things because she's amazing. The complex questions she poses on the role of religion in world building expand our understanding of both inceptive and inspired notions of globalization and imperialism. And as she pushes us to think about these vast concepts, she uses her own lived experience to remind us of how proximate these questions truly are, because they affect the daily lives of the people whose identities they have shaped through practice and through literature. The depth of her intellectual inquiries and her commitment to student success is exemplary, which defies her loss of time, because Jade's scholarly activities would presume she has no time left for teaching or supporting students. Yet somehow she does, and not just as an afterthought, quite the opposite. Tirelessly and with passion, she advocates for her students from the classroom to postgraduate fellowships, and she serves as a model of someone who is shaping her discipline internationally. I can't wait to read Jane's work on the global 19th century and the dialogue between religion and literary productions from East and South Asia. Congratulations, everyone. Here's also another round of applause. Thank you all for being here today, and this is the fun part. Please join us in the dimple to pick up food, because it's cold outside, and then we're going to be seated in Emerson, so you can eat your food. Sounds like a plan? All right. Please rise if you can, and join me. Tom Chocolate and Sing of the Week now.